Perspectives from Gina Brown, MD, NIH, on women and girls living with HIV from CROI, March 2018. We flagged National Women and Girls HIV, aware, HIV and AIDS Awareness Day, I think because pointing to a group that people don't really think about as at risk for HIV, particularly in the United States, and when you have something like National Women and Girls HIV AIDS Awareness Day, it's recognizing that there are women who are living with the virus, there are girls living with the virus. Women across the world have a much higher rate. They are they represent more than 50% of those living with HIV infection. In the United States, it's about somewhere around 20, 22%. But when you look at young women and girls, they're the highest rates of people becoming infected across the world. We often trade one population for another a little bit, looking at, oh, they have a much higher risk, so we have to pay attention. But we can never deliver the message that women and girls aren't equally as important in understanding that they too have risk. And it may not be it may or may not be risk in the sense that we can point to an individual woman or girl, but we have to think about the communities they live in, who are their partners, who are their partner's partners, and what this may mean for their own individual recognition. So if we raise the, the attention that we pay to something like this, we can get women and girls who haven't acquired HIV to perhaps pay closer attention to their ability to protect themselves. We can get providers to pay attention to offering HIV testing, HIV counseling as part of their general health care, and also offering HIV prevention for women who may be at risk. Um, and, uh, and making sure that women who, are, who have acquired HIV are in treatment and are cared for and get adequate information. So I think there's a really exciting presentation, and it was a short presentation, that talked about HIV and pregnancy risk. We often look at when a woman is pregnant, nobody needs to think about what she needs to do to protect herself, so we assume pregnant women don't ever have sex, but that's really not true. But um, there was data that was presented that showed us that women in later pregnancy, and in this case, case they meant more than 14 weeks of gestation, have a much higher risk of HIV, of acquiring HIV infection than women who are prior to um, 14 weeks of gestation. This is important because women are often into care by about anywhere between 12, 13 weeks. So if they get their first HIV um, testing done and it turns out that they're HIV negative, we often don't pay close attention to them again and worry about them having HIV. But if they're at greater risk of becoming infected, if they live in a community where HIV is at a much higher rate, if they have a partner who may have more than one partner, if they themselves may have more than one partner, it's something that we need to really talk with them about. It may be an opportunity for them to take pre-exposure prophylaxis. It may be an opportunity for them to use condoms when they may not have thought about doing that before um, because you assume, well, I can't get pregnant so I must not be at risk, at risk for anything else. Um, so I think that was a really key piece of data that defined it. And it also makes us start to think about, in many jurisdictions, they actually test women again later in pregnancy where you have the opportunity to intervene to prevent mother-to-child transmission, but also to get women on treatment as early as possible. We haven't talked much about pre-exposure prophylaxis. There was an entire session on PrEP, pre-exposure prophylaxis in women. And for the first time, and it, it meant paying attention that this is a useful intervention to prevent HIV infection in women. Some of the ways that PrEP has been used for people who are in discordant relationships, when a woman knows that she has a partner who's living with HIV, there are providers who've given PrEP to those women during their pregnancy to prevent them from acquiring the infection um, and increasing the risk of mother-to-child transmission, but also increasing the risk from, the, from themselves. And so I think these discussions around pre-exposure prophylaxis for women have become increasingly important. In the U.S., we've spent a lot of time looking at PrEP and discussing how absolutely important it is for men who have sex with men who have really high rates of HIV acquisition. We haven't spent nearly as much time talking about it for how useful it is for women, but this is a real opportunity, and this, this time at, at CROI has been a real opportunity to talk about its opportunities for women to use it, what it's going to require to get women in care, get them tested, get them followed up appropriately when they're on pre-exposure prophylaxis, what are the kind of supports that are necessary around it. So I think having this at this very important science meeting really raises the um, specter of, of PrEP use in women, particularly in the United States where we haven't spent nearly as much time really pushing this in, in a population of people at risk. I think one of the really exciting things at CROI this year was the 
paying attention to, when you, particularly with large studies, that you really do have enough women that you can comment on whether it's the same for women as it is for men, and then requiring that when people submitted abstracts that they actually report that data. Often the large studies are just reported as a whole, but requiring that they do that sex breakdown. Um, that's also a fundamental part of what's required in NIH research, that we start to look at sex differences research across the board from basic science up through the clinical studies that we're um, paying attention to. I think for, for providers, being able to point out those differences has them look at women a little bit differently when they're taking care of them and recognizing that the way that they deliver care, the way that people respond to care may not be exactly the same. And we're starting to gather those differences, gather that information from the large clinical studies that are happening. We've had studies on women living with HIV, making the direct comparisons with men. I think um, we've, we've had research that's already made it into the mainstream about how you manage women differently, what are some of the other illnesses you need to look at. Um, I think it's, it's an ongoing process, and the reporting of these things at major conferences really drives that process quickly. So I expect some of that to happen almost immediately. Um, we, there's a large study that's called the Women's Interagency HIV Study, WISE. Um, there's a comparison study, or not a comparison study, but a, a matched study, sort of the brother study of that called the MAX, which is a multi-center AIDS cohort set study, and that's a study of men. So WISE looks at women across the lifespan, MAX has looked at men, and it's been, they're both long-term follow-up studies. Well, they're being combined, so that it'll be a single study that'll look at both men and women, um, answering a lot of these questions and being able to make the direct comparisons. And as that has happened, where they're single studies, and as after they are combined in the coming years, I think that'll continue to drive this importance of recognizing the differences and recognizing the similarities. And I think it'll also let us use resources better, so we'll know when, we, when, when the combined resources work and what things need to be slightly different for the different populations. The Centers for Disease Control had a presentation that looked at associating risk um, in this country and looking at race and risk and really pointing out that African Americans in men who have sex with men but African American women, Latino men, Latino women have much higher rates of HIV risk and, um, and would appropriately be able to, for us to be able to point risk prevention strategies toward them in the U.S. And I think being able to draw that out for women as well lets us begin to focus how we use risk reduction strategies and how we get the word out in populations. Um, it was, again, another one of these small 10-minute presentations, but I think has profound impact because it actually documents the populations at greatest risk in the U.S.